Welcome to the Wine Exchange Tasting Room. And today, uh, I was um, I was asked to uh, fill in for Kyle and do the interview with none other than Mr. Paul Hobbs. So it was like, hmm, what are we going to talk about? You know, because I mean, there's so much to talk about with this guy. I mean, he's pretty much done everything. I mean, you know. Uh, I mean, I'll forgive you for going to Notre Dame because you know, it's a Trojan <laughs> country here. But, uh, you know, where's your tie? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I forgot to tie it home. Sorry. But, uh, uh, but the thing is, is, I mean, your, your history, I mean, working with Mandavi, Opus One, See Me, and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I think it's time to go out on my own. And, uh, and, and, and created your own wine. But, the, but what you have done for our industry is just absolutely amazing. Um, uh, we can talk about so much stuff. I mean, we were talking before, you know, he's in Cahors, he's doing stuff in Armenia. It's like he's just breaking new ground in all these different places. But, but I think, you know, we got to talk about some of the workhorses that, that are part of what you do as well. And, and Crossbarn is, is that, that brand, you know, for, for us, it's really like a, a wine that we sell a lot of here at, at Wine Exchange, and for good, you know, for good reason. The wines taste good. So before we venture to other parts of the world, mainly Argentina, I want to talk about. But sure. but let's talk about Crossbarn. I'd love to because Crossbarn. Well, it's a funny story. In fact, the way Crossbarn came to life was, uh, as many things do, through some some error or or mistake. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it's probably not a story I should tell in public, but in fact, in the year 2000, I was making wine at the um, Laird Family Estate Facilities in Napa Valley, and our tanks were all outside, and they were all open tops. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> that year, the, it was a cold vintage, uh, things went on and on and on, and finally, my partner, Luis Barro, and my project in, in Argentina, said, listen, I can't wait any longer. I've got to go back to Argentina. And I said, well, we haven't picked the grapes yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I can't. so he went back to Argentina, and finally, on the 27th of October, very late, we picked the grapes. Well, I brought, uh, these are Cabernet, and I brought them down. We, the, the last harvest that night was from a vineyard called Stagecoach, but it was nightfall. And so when I got there, uh, Rebecca Laird, the proprietor, said, well, listen, it's too late. Our people are exhausted. We're not going to crush them tonight. Oh, no. <laughs> so where can we put them? There's a, there a three-day storm projected. So we crushed the grapes the next day. We put them under tarp, and we crushed them the next day between squalls that came through into these open-top tanks that were outside. And then I slept with those tanks for the next three nights to protect them because they're open uh, and, and the they were covered, mm -hmm. but if they're not protected, the weight of the water would collapse the covers. So I would get up whenever there was a storm. Well, I just couldn't keep up with one of these torrential downpours, and one tank took some water. <clears throat> and that became Crossbar. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's probably a story as I said I shouldn't tell. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> but it took a little bit of water, and it was just, I mean, I, it was no longer possible, but it was still a very good wine. I mean, I thought right. maybe they have to bulk it out or do something like that, but it was a great wine. So Crossbarn started its life as a declassified wine, but right after that, I started working with growers, and it was, as, you know, if, if some growers wanted to be part of the Paul Hobbs program, but maybe it would take two or three years of working together, even longer, right. for them to get to a point where their, their fruit would, would be able to enter the Paul Hobbs program. Right. So then, so it really started off as, as that kind of a program. And, 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 and as a second de label, a declassified program, but today it's its own thing. And it's mainly a, a, a wine lot that's based on fresh fruit, very vibrant fruit, and uh, there's oak, but it's neutral oak, or relatively neutral, so there's no new oak used mm -hmm. for very little. Uh, we, we, I would prefer to work with it so it's imperceptible. So that's sort of the, the basis, and uh, as the core of any wine is fruit, mm -hmm. you know, the classic model for fruit is 100% bottle price. And right. so if a wine sells for $50, then you would pay $5,000 a ton. We pay more than the classic to get the quality of fruit. But I figure we save on the oak. That's the one area, as I'm one of a, uh, 
and the second oldest of 11. Okay. And I got my brother's hand-me-downs, but I didn't get really all the hand-me-downs <laughs> that my other ones got. <laughs> so in this case, what we really do is Paul Hobbs barrels are then, once they're finished for the Paul Hobbs program, they move okay. into, into the cross barn. Oh, yeah. So they're neutral. They're really high-quality barrels, but the idea is not to impart oak. So, I mean, uh, when you talk about farmers and working a couple of years and being part of the program, is this something that you actually go out into the vineyards or specific vineyards or specific farmers and say, okay, yeah, you want to be part of my program, but what, what influence do you have on their farming? I mean, is it something that you actually, because obviously you're a consultant and you consult for many wineries, do you go to the farmers in the same vein and say, okay, these are... You know, this is the vineyard, this is what I want to work with, uh, I want you to do this, 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 and this. Very much so. I mean, that's yeah. part of the selection process, of, of course, in any situation, having good partners. And uh, it's almost the most important part, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as you can imagine. Yeah. So, uh, and we want partners that uh, interact with us. And, and so it maybe it's more like a European model in that sense, mm -hmm. where we <clears throat> look for growers that really are responsive to the kind of wine that we want to make and will farm according to our criteria. Mm -hmm. However, we want, we want the collaboration, we want their participation, not just say, uh, well, you can do whatever you want gotcha. as long as you pay me this amount of money. And we much prefer they know their land, they know things that we don't know, so we think that that exchange is far richer. Now you said, uh, you know, you know, prior to going to camera, that you purchase 80 acres. In, in Sonoma specifically for cross barn. Yes. So now are any of these grapes going into the wines that we well not yet. Okay. <laughs> not yet because okay. that vineyard was just purchased and that was December well just nine or ten months ago. Oh, okay. So it's gonna make and it's Chardonnay initially. We budded some of it, but it's a large vineyard for us. Mm -hmm. Uh but it is a dedicated it's the first estate vineyard and it's all Chardonnay but we've but did some of it over to Pinot Noir, okay. and so we will will see fruit for the first time with this vintage. Oh, cool! So now, right. obviously, that is going to Chardonnay. If you're budding over to Pinot, um, well, that will be probably further down the road. Yes, okay. that's a new vineyard that the, that the previous owners had already planted. So okay. it was planted the year before. We tea butted it over. Oh, okay. So it's 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 a relatively the right time to do it if you're going to do that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So that'll go to our Pinot Noir program. So talking about Chardonnay, we have Chardonnay in the glass. Um, so where is this fruit sourced from? I mean, is there specific vineyards this, that you're looking at? This is several vineyards, okay. and it's it's a Rush, a Russian River, but basically this is it's called Sonoma Coast, which also interestingly includes Rush, Russian River. Mm -hmm. It's it's mostly coastal fruit, but with some Russian River fruit, and it goes all the way into the Petaluma Gap uh, region. So. These are cool sites, and the idea here is to, we, I, I look at this, this particular wine as sort of a bridge between Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. It doesn't obviously have the characteristics of Sauvignon Blanc in the flavor and fruit profile, but it does in terms of the brightness of the acidity. Mm -hmm. Still fermented, but what's u unusual, I think, is it has a full malolactic fermentation. And so as you can imagine, it has a an element of weight and creaminess to it, but it has this crisp acidity. Snap. And I do that for more than just the textural aspects or even the flavor components of the malolactic fermentation. I do it also because I don't want to filter it hard. In the early years when I worked at Mondavi, one of the things that we did extensive trials was on filtration. And we learned that type filtration, or what we call sterile filtration, to remove either yeast or bacteria, strips the wine permanently and lose, you lose weight. You have brilliant clarity and you can sleep well at night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but today we have such good control that we're not able, we can, we can see the exact microbiological microbiolo makeup of the wine. Mm -hmm. But we work hard so that we don't have to sterile filter the wine. I mean, yeah, I, I see what you're saying and the flavor profile of this wine, it's very, the, it, the acidity is very snappy. It, it, you, you taste that coolness. You can smell the coolness almost. You know, <laughs> you, you 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 smell that malolactic kind of, you know, in the nose. But it, you know, you could you could taste that coolness in, in the wine. Now, talk about something you do very well: Pinot Noir as well as Chardonnay and Cabernet. 
by the way, but uh, and now back. Well, Pinot Noir has been a passion of mine for a long time, and I worked with Henri Jaillet many years ago, back in the 80s, for a period of time, and I had the privilege of just spending some time in Burgundy as a worker and, and also as just a <laughs> yeah. aficionado, Pinot Noir. At any rate, I discovered some things while I was working there in the 80s. Well, we were just on the cusp of developing great Pinot Noir in California. And I think a lot of what re was required was better wood, better material. Mm -hmm. And so some intrepid winemakers um, brought suitcase in some cuttings. <laughs> and I think that helped. That was a game changer, frankly, yeah. for California. Well, I've always been one that if you can, because basically the Pinot Noir cluster is a really compact, tight cluster. Mm -hmm. Well, but there are some clones or some selections of, of the grape that are more open architecture. And I find that those lignify the, the rachis or the stem. And I like to use them as whole cluster, which the Burgundians have been doing for years. Mm -hmm. But there is this myth that if you do that, you know, and the rachis is not lignified or woody, that uh, a green, that it would be green and that would add greenness to the wine. Well, in fact, that's, again, that's a myth. Right, right, right. <laughs> so we did a lot of experimentation. Well, this is made in a very similar way. It's hand-punched, uh, which means we hand-punch the cap during fermentation for extraction. And it's a very short contact with skins because Pinot Noir ferments almost in the rate of two and a half to three times faster than Cabernet Sauvignon. So fast fermentation mm -hmm. and builds a lot of heat and the skins are thin so that it compresses the cap. And so we have to keep the ratio of the tank is just the opposite of a Cabernet tank. It's more like this table, as a matter of fact. It's not very tall, very mm -hmm. wide. And we have to hand punch it. Well, with those skins, thin skins, it gets as hard as concrete. Mm -hmm. In a tank that's four feet tall, a full-grown individual can walk across it. Wow. Without any problem. I wouldn't recommend it, just yeah, in case yeah. you don't go in. But <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and then this, this sees 11 months in barrels mm -hmm. and uh, goes through a... A very, I mean, the idea again is clean and fresh. So and you're a neutral oak here. Neutral oak. Okay. Yes. And and the fruit sourcing for this is also Sonoma Coast. Vineyards very similar, not the same growers, but very similar sites. Mm -hmm. Cool sites all the way from Annapolis in the northern part of Sonoma all the way down to the Petaluma Gap. Okay. Well, whew. after that, I need a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Buenos Aires. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, uh, well, we have to have you back because, you know, we have to talk about Argentina now. And, and then probably by the time you come back, we can talk about Armenia. And <laughs> we can then talk about uh, Cahor and all the other places uh, that I'd you are. To. Where I'd in do. the world is Paul Hobbs, you know? But uh, anyways, thank you so much for being with us and, and coming on camera. And uh, uh, you're just doing fantastic work. We're big fans. Great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.